I'm uh, Lieutenant Harbison, and today we're going to be covering ergonomics. Uh, this is not a 10 hour course, but this is a 10 hour course I teach, um, or I used to teach when I was a civilian. So, <clears throat> so we're going to learn about ergonomics and how to hopefully. Oh, are you guys recording right now? Yes. Oh, and uh, we're going to learn about ergonomics and how to hopefully incorporate it in your daily lives as well as within your work spot, uh, work, workspace. So we'll first identify common work-related musculoskeletal disorders, or WMSDs, which is what I'll be referring to throughout the whole entire presentation because work-related musculoskeletal disorders is a mouthful, so, yep. So common examples of WMSDs that, have, uh, that you've probably heard of are carpal tunnel syndrome, trigger finger, and tennis elbow, right? Have you guys heard of any of those? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, we'll next cover the risk factors associated with WMSDs, and finally, uh, we'll identify common ergonomic problems and control methods you can incorporate within your workspace. <clears throat> so by a show of hands, who here has heard of ergonomics? Oh my god, this is, this is great. You guys hear about it from the next, last group that just left, is that why? <laughs> yeah? Well, that's good, that's really good, because this is actually a fairly new topic um, but I think the, the younger generation that's coming out is learning more about it because they want to be comfortable at work. So can someone here please tell me what they think ergonomics is or what they believe it is? Posture. Huh? Body posture. Body posture, yeah. That's a component of it. Support. Yep. Um, duration of time doing yeah, you, you've taken this before, haven't you? This is like, like, okay. I was like, what? Okay, anyways. Um, so in general, ergonomics, not economics, uh, means designing, designing jobs, equipment, and work tasks to fit human physical characteristics and energy limitations, because we're all designed differently, right? Uh, in, uh, it considers body dimensions, mobility, and the body's stress behavior. So in general, make the, uh, make the work fit the person and not the person fit the work. And typically ergonomics looks at these areas here, your workstation, the tools that you utilize, and the equipment. So in short, ergo is work and nomics is law. So why is ergonomics important? Uh, overexertion is a leading cause of injury within the workplace, especially in the Army. Uh, it is very expensive for both the employers as well as the employees in terms of insurance. And the employees who are not treated properly can develop reoccurrences as well as persistent pain in the future. Uh, bodily reaction such as bending, climbing, reaching, standing and sitting in repetitive motions are other leading causes of workplace injuries. Uh, the following pie, pie chart illustrates workplace injuries and illnesses by event within the civilian sector. Uh, as you can see, WMSDs account for 32% of all injuries at, uh, within the workplace, and the professions which suffer the most are going to be your nursing assistants because you have to pick up the patients, uh, your freight, and your material, material movers, which is you know people who work in warehouses such as Amazon. Uh, WMSDs affect muscles, nerves, blood vessels, ligaments, and tendons. Uh, below is a list of symptoms. You can see the various symptoms here. Uh, <clears throat> WMSDs can be prevented through the use of proper ergonomics. So I know some of you guys might have, uh, when I first got into this, I remember thinking, oh, I've sat, I remember sitting in this chair and I just couldn't adjust it and it made me feel really weird. And, you know, in that case, that's like, I sat in an ergonomic chair, but it wasn't set right. So hopefully this presentation can kind of assist you fix your chair, maybe back in your office or even at your next job or so forth. Uh, it can help decrease muscle fatigue, increase productivity, and reduce the number and severity of WMSDs. Uh, here's a list of common uh, WMSDs. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I've suffered uh, sciatic pain before from long drives. Um, I don't know if you, any, of you, any of you guys have, but it's like a, 
feels like an electric current I had going from my hip all the way down my leg. It was only on my right side too, but after like a, maybe like two weeks of stretching, um, it eventually went away. But you wanna make sure you, you kind of target those because these are gonna be your indicators, or actually, these are gonna be your indicators that you might develop uh, some of these. So you wanna to try to target it in advance. Uh, the following pie chart illustrates non-fatal occupational injuries and illnesses requiring days away from work within the civilian sector. Uh, based on percentage, the upper, which is going to be your shoulder all the way down to your fingers, and then the lower, which is going to be your hips all the way down to your toes, uh, extremities are the most commonly affected. And you can see right here, most people in the civilian sector get injured here, um, the upper, and then it's going to be your lower, and then a high percentage in the back region. I think in, in military, back is usually the thing that goes out first, right? Back and then your knees. <clears throat> so the next few slides will discuss risk factors associated with WMSDs. The three common factors of WMSD injuries depends on work positions and postures, the frequency of the task being performed, and the amount of required effort and duration of the task. So you're absolutely right on a lot of these right here. So the first example we're gonna look at uh, is exerting excess force. Can somebody provide me an example of exerting, of exerting excess force within a job, any job? So a construction worker maybe doing what? Picking stuff up. Yep, picking heavy stuff up. Lifting heavy objects, people. Uh, manually pouring materials. And then the second risk is gonna be uh, performing the same or similar tasks repetitively over and over again. I don't know if any of you guys have worked in manufacturing, but I've worked as a, a safety professional, and I've seen people, like, they have it set up where people just stand there for two hours doing the same task over and over and over and over, and they're okay with that. But now they have a system where they rotate them out every two hours to different jobs. Uh, the third example is working in awkward postures or being in the same position for long periods of time. Um, do we know a position here that stands in, in the same position for long periods of time? Can we, huh? Parade rest. Pra no, 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 but like, <laughs> but like a job, not parade rest. Cooks and everything. Cooks, yeah, but they kind of move a little bit more. What about, what about the gate guards, right? They stand in long periods of time, and the thing is, if they're not wearing properly comfortable shoes over time, and these guys have been here for years, they're gonna start developing back problems just because they're just staying there wearing uncomfortable shoes on hard ground for long periods of time. In the office setting, you typically wanna wear uh, either uh, comfortable insoles or you wanna wear, uh, stand on like an anti-fatigue mat because that helps you kind of move around, allows your calves to utilize different muscle groups. Um, <clears throat> localized pressure. The second part right here, oh, here's some examples as well. So localized pressure into the body part is our fourth example. Uh, can we, can you guys give me some examples of what you guys think that might mean? Repeat the question. Uh, localized pressure into a body, body part. So <clears throat> this, is, this is a little bit difficult. So here are some examples right here, but think about it like, you're at your desk typing away, right? You don't have a wrist rest. The desk is slightly higher than you because, you know, uh, desks are just, army desks specifically, they don't adjust. So what are, you, what are you gonna do with your wrists? You're gonna rest them on like the edge of the desk, right? When you rest your wrists on the edge of the desk, what happens is you start slowly cutting off the blood circulation. And over long periods of time, it can result in tingling of the fingers. Um, you can also, uh, sorry, brain fart. But um, uh, it can result in a lot of other uh, health-related issues. Um, but typically, that slide that I showed you, you wanna go ahead and, if you're starting to feel those symptoms, kinda hit the nail on the head and target and, and correct that issue before it gets severe. So the fifth example is <clears throat> uh, cold temperatures, which when combined with any of the previously mentioned risk factors can increase the potential for WMSDs to develop. Think about if you've ever been in a situation where you're outside working on something and you're not, and it's cold outside, 
and you're not utilizing gloves, right? And you're using that tool. So now you're having to utilize more energy just to hold on to that tool because uh, you're not wearing gloves. So not only are you doing the task, you're having to exert more pressure on it just to have a good grip on it. And that can even be in like rainy conditions as well. Um, the next uh, one would be vibration of whole body or in hands and arms, uh, which can cause numerous health, health effects. So people that work in freight when they're driving in the trucks, they typically will have like lower back problems because they're sitting in that truck and it's bouncing up and down, especially the older trucks. And you can feel the whole vibrations throughout the cab. Uh, people utilizing jackhammers, they've developed um, uh, really bad issues with their hands where their hands are just constantly shaking. Uh, and the last risk factor are typically associated with jobs that have numerous risk factors such as mechanic shop where your mechanic has to go dig into your engine and has to twist and turn their own body and trying to get in just to go replace your oil filter or whatever. Uh, meat, process, meat processing facilities as well as warehousing. Um, so there are various uh, ergonomic control methods uh, to eliminate or reduce WMSDs. Uh, the first control method is individual fitness. I'm sure everybody here does PT in the morning, right? Wake up early, they get excited, they go hit the gym or they go on a run. Yeah? Yeah, yeah okay, good, good. Um, or maybe in the evening, that's fine too, because uh, the first, <clears throat> the more fit you are, the less likely you'll injure yourself on the job. So exercising regularly builds up our manual labor tolerance, uh, as well as teaches us proper form when lifting, lowering, as well as gripping heavy objects. Uh, having a well-established program, which the Army does, which is DAPAM 40-21, uh, you can talk to your safety rep about this, your unit safety officer. They're supposed to be kind of familiar with this. That encompasses training and feedback, promotes ergonomic hazard awareness, and the utilization of JHAs or JSAs. Has anybody heard of those terms? Job hazard analysis or job safety? Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and discuss that on the next slide. And lastly, developing a process of recognizing uh, and reporting potential uh, WMSDs. So this is a job hazard analysis. In the Army, you, you typically will see this every once in a while if, if your safety program is pretty robust. In industry, you will see lots of these. Um, and they typically need to be updated based off of the job. So what it is is basically, you, it's a tool that allows you to identify every single little hazard within a job. So what you do is you write down the task and you break it down into various steps, right? So I just kind of summarize it all here, but you write the task, you break it down into steps and you identify the hazard associated with each step if there is a potential hazard. And then you go ahead and write down the control measures for each one. So here I have typing reports eight hours a day, five days a week, which over a long period of time if you're not set up correctly, it can result in carpal tunnel syndrome. And then here's your control measures that you can utilize right here. And then here's some more examples right here. Um, our second ergonomic control uh, method is gonna be your engineering control. As you can see right here, uh, typically engineering controls are gonna be provided by the employer, right? So they're gonna be uh, uh, height adjusting tables. I know the, the new movement has been to get the types of tables that lift and lower automatically. Um, you can even use a stool because like I said, not all people are, are designed the same. Or, uh, so some people are taller than others. So you have to adjust that workstation so you reduce fatigue. We have this contraption here, which is a table that's inclined and you have rollers, so these pieces of equipment kind of roll to that person so that person doesn't have to reach over and pull. And in this case, you got Joe the worker is not having to carry this heavy piece of, uh, this heavy part 10 feet to this person here. They can just kind of roll it. Uh, administrative and work practice controls uh, establish effective processes and procedures. Examples of these controls are requiring that heavy loads only be lifted by two people to limit force exertion. Uh, you can also, um, so if, the, if, if a load is too heavy, let's say, I know most jobs require, they'll have in the additional duties, you have to be able to pick up at least 50 pounds or less, right? But like most jobs have that standard. I know North Carolina, I think it's like, they set it at like 40. Um, 
But most jobs, if it's, if it's something that's big or kind of awkward, you typically want to use the buddy system. You want to make sure that if, the, if, if it is a load that you can carry, you test the weight by kind of like picking it up slightly to go see if you can actually pick it up, bring it into your body zone, um, and then go ahead and lift. And that's the same thing with the buddy system as well. You want to make sure that you incorporate task rotation. So you go in, do this task for X amount of time, and you switch out with another person. Uh, you have increased rest breaks if it is a lot of uh, heavy lifting. Oh, and the last one is uh, proper PMCS of equipment. Because what happens is whenever you're using a piece of equipment, if it's, if it's like a drill or something and it's starting to get dull, humans like to compensate. So, if, it's, so if, the, if the drill bit and you're pushing on it, it's starting to get dull, uh, then you need to stop what you're doing and get a new drill bit as opposed to forcing it in and pushing all your uh, weight on it. Does this make sense? Um, our next ergonomic control method is PPE. Uh, is used uh, of protection to reduce exposure to ergonomic uh, risk factors. So some examples, and in general, in terms of uh, PPE when it comes to ergonomics is padded items, right? So like I was mentioning earlier, um, you wanna get uh, anti-fatigue mats so you can stand on it or nice comfortable insoles. The Army issues us knee pads, elbow pads for a reason, right? We wanna make sure that we use it if we have to go shoot in prone position or so forth. Um, if you're doing any type of yard work and you're utilizing a chainsaw, something that causes a lot of vibration, you wanna use padded gloves. Uh, typically, if you're doing it for a short period of time, it's okay unless you're using like a pretty old model that vibrates a lot, or if the piece of equipment is, is certain, is like on its last life, um, then you wanna use uh, padded gloves. And these gloves right here are, uh, are also padded. There's also another one on here, where is it? Grip, gripping gloves. So in warehousing, typically they give, them, they give them cotton gloves, which are pretty bad when you're picking up boxes because it just slides right off. So the gloves that are, preferred are your gloves with grips on them. So what that, that helps you in terms of not having to put so much force on it. All right, so this picture illustrates work zones as it relates to ergonomics. Ideally, all work zones should take place in the primary work zone because, which is right here, uh, because it's where the work, worker has the most power to exert and can easily control the task effectively. So the further you go out, the, le the more difficult it becomes to control the task or whatever you're doing. And you can also injure yourself. So ideally you wanna to try to do all tasks within kind of like this zone here. Um, not all the way out here, but it happens. But when you're about to do that, just kind of recognize, oh, I'm putting myself in a weird posture or position. Let me go ahead and adjust my body and do that and, and, and complete the task uh, much more safely. So we all got the, uh, you know, in our part-time jobs growing up, we all got the spiel of, of how to properly lift, right? So we lift with our back, right? Yeah. We, lift, we lift with our legs. You wanna make sure, yeah? Make sure that you pick up the item, you have the item positioned as closely to your body as possible. You go ahead and bend down and you grab the item, have a good grip, and then you go ahead and lift. And when you do lift, you make sure you have a straightened back and you lift as, and you carry it as closely to your body as possible, and you're walking in the direction, ensuring that you have a clear path to wherever you gotta go. All right, so this next uh, slide is a video of office ergonomics, and it just kind of tells you how to set up your, your workstation so that you can kind of reduce the fatigue that if you, if you do suffer any type of office fatigue. on the floor, you're leaning back a little bit, your shoulders are relaxed, and your hands are in your lap. This is called your neutral posture, and you can keep it this way while you work, you'll be in good shape. With that in mind, let's build an ergonomic workstation. The most important part of a comfy desk is making sure your keyboard and mouse are positioned correctly. Considering this neutral posture, your keyboard should be set one to two inches above your thighs 
and should be close enough to you so that your elbows stay by your sides. For most people, that probably means getting a keyboard tray or lowering your desk. But remember, only one to two inches above the top of your legs. When you're there, position your devices so that they're close to shoulder distance apart and that they're parallel with your thighs so that you're not extending your wrists like this. Keep the keyboard flat and forget about using those little kickstands. And speaking of your wrists, don't ever use a wrist rest. Resting your palms is one thing, but the moment you use a wrist rest, you cut off blood circulation and hello carpal tunnel. Oh. Next up, I've got a couple useful tips for setting up your screen. First, the distance. If it's too far away, you'll start craning your neck to read what's off the screen. To find the sweet spot, extend your arm, and the tip of your middle finger should land on your screen. So slide the monitor forward or back until you find that spot. If you have two monitors, set them up side by side at an angle. Keep them as close as possible to each other so that when you hand your arm in an arc, your fingers are with just both screens. In this case, I use this screen more often, so I'll center it a little bit more. Now let's talk about height. There's no cut and dry rule, but here's a little trick. Facing your monitor, close your eyes. When you open them, your eyes should land on the address bar. If they don't, lower or raise the monitors, either with the built-in option, with risers, or with books. Last of all, tilt those monitors just a smidge to avoid reflections. Where everything finally comes together is your chair. It supports your back, your bottom, and of course, your posture. There are lots of chairs to choose from, but a few important things to look out for. First, it should have good lumbar support for your back. And when you sit down, there should be a little space between the edge of your seat and the back of your knees, about the size of your fist. Then the last thing to do is to make sure your feet don't dangle. If they're dangling, don't adjust the height of the chair because you'll mess everything else up. Instead, grab a footrest, slip it under your desk, and problem solved. All right, so I know some of you guys uh, caught the whole padding of the wrist. So what it is is you don't want it's okay to use the, the padding um, as a wrist rest, but you don't want it having up. Ideally, you wanna have your arm at more of a 90 degree or less angle, so it's okay to still use it. You, what she was talking about was to have it a little bit higher. All right, so uh, employee employer requirements. So ensure that you report any of these symptoms to your safety rep and they can kind of report it up their chain. It'll eventually probably come to me or somebody else and then we can come out and assess you. Uh, now that we've covered various aspects of ergonomics, uh, it's your turn to share the knowledge. Uh, when you get back to your uh, work area, ensure that you incorporate some of these ergonomic um, tips as well as in your home life and when you guys redeploy back to your home station. Uh, listed here are some tips on how to get involved. Um, and in summary, here are five points uh, to remember about ergonomics. And then in the last three slides, if you guys want, you guys can pull out your cameras. I have three really good uh, websites you guys can go to for additional ergonomic stuff. Or ergonomic information as well. Because I know some of you guys are not active. Uh, you, you, it's, it's just active on this deployment, so probably be pretty helpful. So right here, here's the first website. You got Army Public Health Command. You can actually talk to a certified ergonomist. Um, by just going to this website, clicking this button. They're probably gonna require some information out of you in terms of what do you do, how long do you do it, maybe some pictures as well. Um, so this is a, a very good help. Uh, I can actually come out as well, because I've, I've done it for about 10 years, but I don't have a lot of my tools, but I can, I can figure something out. Um, here's another website, CDC has some really good websites. So based off of uh, what you do in your civilian life, you can go here and figure out, because I'm sure uh, people in very similar civilian careers have similar issues, and they'll, they'll post them here in terms of solutions. And then the next website is OSHA, uh, which is right here, covers ergonomics, same thing, they provide uh, a wealth of good information. All right, so I'm done, any questions? Has everybody signed in? All right, good. Thank you.